Thank those of you who just uh, uh, just joined us. Um, the morning sessions focused really on the uh, historical um, experience experiences of African Americans at the University of uh, of Chicago, and we thought it would be appropriate and illuminating for the afternoon if we move to the uh, present by having first uh, members of the faculty here at the University of Chicago and then second students at the University of Chicago take this um, symposium and again the uh, Integrating the Life of the Mind exhibit as an opportunity to um, talk about what um, the, the ways in which the current experience of being a scholar or student at the University of Chicago are, uh, is inflect, are inflect, the experiences are inflected and inflect um, a, a notion of uh, race. And for this uh, first uh, uh, roundtable, I'm pleased to have a number of my esteemed uh, uh, colleagues, and I will, uh, uh, whom I will uh, introduce in alphabetical order. So starting all the way to my left, your right, is uh, uh, Kathy Cohen, the uh, <clears throat> David and Mary Winton Green Professor of Political Science and uh, a Deputy Provost for Graduate Affairs and Research um, for the last year, um, and a welcome addition to the fifth floor, uh, where I spend part of my time as well. Uh, Kathy is the author of The Boundaries of Blackness, AIDS, and the Breakdown of Black Politics, University of Chicago Press, a book in 1999, and co-editor with Jacqueline Jones and Jean Tronto of Women Transforming Politics, an alternative reader um, from NYU Press in 1997. Um, her work has uh, been published in um, a variety of uh, journals and edited volumes, including the American Political Science Review, GLQ, Nomos, and Social Text. She's also editor with Fred Harris of a new book series from the Ox Oxford Press entitled Transgressing Boundaries, Studies in Black Politics and Communities. Um, and her general field of specialization is in American uh, politics, although her research interests include African American politics, women politics, lesbian, gay, politics and social movements. And she's currently, she just finished up, finishing. She, she can get up this panel, working on, um, a book uh, on deviance and uh, on politics. So we will try to observe our time limits today so that Kathy can uh, get to her work. Um, second on the panel, and on my immediate left, is my colleague in the uh, English department, Jackie Goldsby, associate professor there and author of the uh, uh, prize-winning, uh, William Sanders Scarborough prize-winning book, A Spectacular Secret, The Cultural Logic of Lynching in American Life and Literature a book that considers how aesthetic representations of lynching in fiction, poetry, and photography um, <clears throat> bear within their compositional structures a secret or otherwise buried history of the violence, a history that implicates this practice of racial terrorism with uh, pivotal, pivotal developments in American modernity. Um, Jackie is also um, the um, um, shaping of, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> um, um, uh, force behind uh, the Mapping the Stacks project, um, picking up on, on Adam's uh, 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 category of an archivist. Um, uh, Jackie sort of more than fulfills that at the current, uh, 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 current moment, both an archivist and in some sense a placeholder, uh, building not only the um, arch archival resources of the city of Chicago and the University of Chicago, but creating um, archival and research experiences and opportunities for an array of um, graduates, uh, graduate students. Um, <clears throat> um, let's see, yeah, going in alphabetical order, um, Rick Kittles uh, uh, is Associate Professor of Medicine in the section of Genetic Medicine. His research locus on formal evaluation of the genetic mechanisms involved in complex focuses on the formal evaluation of the genetic mechanisms involved in complex diseases. His work entails understanding how <clears throat> genetic variation is structured across human uh, populations and how that variation contributes to inter-individual variation in disease susceptibility and other phenotypes such as drug response and skin color. He is the author of many papers that have appeared in such leading journals as Human Genetics and the Journal of um, uh, uh, Medical um, genetics, and he's a crucial player in our um, uh, health disparities uh, <clears throat> group here at the university. And last but not least, by any means, is uh, Gina Samuels, who's assistant professor 
at the uh, School of Social Service Administration. She's also a faculty associate of the Chapin Hall Center for Children at the University of Chicago. Her work examines two <clears throat> broad themes, um, identity development among transracial adoptees and the aging out of young adults from foster care. She's currently involved in several research projects, a national study of multiracial adult transracial adoptees to explore racial and cultural identity development, racial socialization, coping strategies, and broad outcomes <clears throat> of well-being funded by the Heller Research Award. Um, and a she's also involved in a study of Illinois youth with, youth with histories of running away from their foster homes to understand where they run to and why. Um, and additionally involved, I'm going to how you find time to do all of this. I was looking at this, <laughs> a three-state uh, mixed method longitudinal study of broad outcomes among youth aging out of foster care in the Midwest, funded by the WT Grant Foundation, and a national study seeking to understand the relational networks of young adults with foster care backgrounds, which is funded by Jim Casey Youth, uh, the Jim Casey Youth Opportunities Initiative. And I edited out a whole lot of stuff uh, there so you can get a sense of um, uh, her, her activities. So what I'd like to do today, I've uh, circulated some questions among the panelists, and I'll just go ahead. This thing keeps buzzing right now. At least I keep hearing it. Maybe I'll put it on my tie again. OK, maybe that'll work better. At least it's bothering me. Um, <clears throat> I uh, have circulated some questions among our panelists, which I will pose uh, to them, and we'll have a conversation here. And then uh, maybe after about 40, 45 minutes of conversation, um, perhaps even before that, accept questions from the, uh, uh, from, from the floor. Um, so although I went in alphabetical order, I think I'll just start in <coughs> proximate order. And, and, um, uh, and the first question I asked our panelists to consider is, um, how do they assess the University of Chicago? as a, uh, a place of, for uh, research, teaching, and learning um, as an African-American faculty member. If I could ask uh, Jackie to. Uh, okay. and speaking to this mic, OK. Um, I should say I've been here at the university since 2001. And I came here from Cornell was the first job that I had. Um, and for me, the absolute draw here was the English department. Um, and the special ways in which its uh, commitment to what counted as the American canon, it was a robust comparative American canon that we all cared about studying here, and the equally robust commitment to when all is said and done, uh, the English department here cares about interdisciplinary um, textual interpretation and cares about archives. So a kind of historical materialist orientation towards literary study, but deeply informed by theory as well, was incredibly attractive to me. Um, and so the ways in which the intellectual commitment, the methodology, the pedagogy about how classes get taught and where African American literature fit within the American scheme um, is unique here. There are not too many other English departments who care about that intersection in quite the same way and where we can sit around a table and talk about what, you know, what's your archive. Uh, that matters to me, having been trained in American studies and being a scholar who <coughs> thinks about African American literature as integral to American literary life and um, history and who cares about um, materialist analysis. So that was a real um, distinctive um, feature about the University of Chicago's English department. The university itself, when I came here to give my job talk and asked my mentors, should I do this? Um, they all described the University of Chicago as, well, that's an intense place. It's really intense. Intense, intense, intense. And I thought, well, what could that mean? It's like when you go to grad school and everybody says you should care about the library. And I didn't quite know what that meant until I went to Yale, I should say. And then I, know what a real, I, I understood what a really good library kind of owns. But um, here the word was intense. And what intense meant was just this absolute passionate ferocity with which people take work seriously. I had never had my work taken as seriously here as anywhere else, never. Um, the care with which people read the footnotes to my paper and asked me questions, well, on page 42 of your paper you say X, but on footnote 11 you said Y. Can you talk about that connection? 
and, and they had all read the text that I was writing about, James Olin Johnson's Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man, and that just floored me. Um, and that was the case across the board. One of our rites of passages here in the Humanities Division is that you have to give a lecture to, um, the, to our colleagues the, uh, through the Frankie Institute. And there must have been about 40 people at my talk, not just from the English department, from, but from all departments across the Humanities Division, asking me incredibly helpful questions about the chapter draft I was presenting from my then first book um, that wound up working their way into that final draft. Um, but the intellectual curi curiosity, the intensity with which argument matters here first, um, was incredibly attractive to me. I've not encountered it anywhere else. Um, and, and so that life of the mind model really is lived here. I thought it was a cliche, frankly. Um, but that's, that's, that's an ethos everyone takes very seriously here. And it's something I've really grown to respect, not only as a scholar, but as a woman of color. Because it's my arguments that count most of all here. And if I make a good argument, my students will follow me. Um, and that matters to me. So that's what's been distinctive about this place for me as an African American and an African Americanist scholar. Okay. Yeah, Tina. So I, I certainly could echo everything that you've you've said. That was absolutely true for me as well. I'm over in the School of Social Service Administration, and um, down to what people said when I was on the job market. Um, Gina, you're not going to go there, are you? I thought, oh, well, what's there? Right? I was familiar. I was from the Midwest, and I was very familiar with SSA. Um, and SSA has a very long history in social work, starting with Hull House and. Sophie Nibspa Breckenridge, who is a founding mother of social work. So I grew up in my social work tradition knowing very clearly what SSA was, didn't imagine that I would find myself here. I was a social work scholar that cared very much about practice and that my work would be used um, and that I would be having access to students who would be interested in the things that I was studying so that I could teach and, and make use of that as a venue to disseminate my work as much as um, journals. And I found that when I came, also, that people engaged in my work in a level that I had not even experienced my committee engaging in my work, and um, I never thought I would say that either. I think the other part, though, that I found attractive about coming here for scholarship was that there was a, a community that I could engage in for my scholarship that was very important. And so I had, before coming here, taught at a number of other institutions. I had been teaching for at least 10 years before I came here. and. Um, was very excited by the idea that I wouldn't just have to teach my students concepts about diversity, about uh, on multiple levels, um, about family diversity, structural diversity, but that I would have students and a community laboratory where my work could thrive. And that was also very important to me as well. Um, and to have a faculty that was very diverse. Unlike many social work departments, our social work department is interdisciplinary. And so usually in social work, um, you find folks are all social workers. And while that's, that's great, uh, on one level, I find that it absolutely enriches the education of our students to think interdisciplinary about very applied pro processes, even though that can be hard for folks who aren't necessarily trained to think about the ways in which their work can be directly uh, impacting families, parenting, school processes, those sorts of things. And so that I found absolutely attractive for myself. So I, I also echo uh, s similar uh, uh, sentiments uh, about, the, about the university. But in all frankness, no, I, I think um, uh, for many, you know, you think about the University of Chicago and you say, oh, you, you've arrived, you know, this is you know, the pinnacle sort of of the, of, 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 of the academy, right? Um, uh, so in thinking back at when I decided to come here, um, uh, actually, I didn't come here the first time. <laughs> so, okay, let me go back a little bit. Uh, so I've been here about two and a half years, and um, I was, uh, uh, my first um, faculty position was at Howard University. And um, I remember, uh, working on my on my my dissertation, my PhD, and I actually was uh, had a really good job offer to come here for a postdoc, 
uh, in, in human genetics, which at the time, this is back in 97, I believe, 96, 97, um, it, it wasn't a department, it was a committee. You know, you go through those committees and then after a while you get a critical mass, you can become a department, right? So it was a committee, but these guys were, you know, the, the best and the brightest in human genetics, and in particular population genetics in theory. And that's what I was in, into. I mean, it was that's all I knew. That's all I was excited about. And so it was it was an honor to sort of get this postdoc offer. And and um, uh, uh, but at the same time, though, I was looking for a little bit more because in my during my visits here, I didn't see anybody like myself. You know, the sciences are a little different. You know, the sciences aren't like SSA where right. you know you see a lot of women and um, blacks and Hispanics. Uh, you know, in, in medicine and in, in, in uh, the, the, the biological sciences, it's, it's rather um, homogeneous. And so that bothered me, given where this university was located. I know that it had a rich history on the south side, and it had connections or a lack of connections with the south side. So, you know, there's this love-hate relationship that I knew, and I didn't necessarily think that the university was really in a... Um, uh, taking advantage of that, of that, um, uh, uh, of the needs and just the relationship with the community. So anyway, I decided to go to Howard University, and and that was a good decision for me at that time because it allowed me to um, uh, really see where uh, I needed to focus my work. And so, um, uh, uh, in coming here, I was I was better prepared to handle sort of the. <laughs> The uh, the situation that I that I that I'm in now. <laughs> so that's why I say you know you, you may have arrived, but you have to make sure you're ready for that arrival. You know what I'm saying? So um, uh, I'm I'm glad I experienced what I did at Howard because it, it allowed me to understand the richness of this community here on the South Side and the need for this relationship with the university, in particular the hospital, the med center, and and the like. Um, and it is intense. It's, it's very intense. And, and that's what um, my advisors, my mentors said to me. They said, you know, it, it's, uh, it's very intense there. And, and that's what I like, though. I mean, I think all of us here sort of like that, that, that um, it, the argument, you know, crafting the argument, convincing your colleagues, and um, uh, really checking, making sure your work is, is, is on point because um, uh, it's very intense here. And so, and so, which is you know, which is a good thing, right? Um, so, 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 yeah. But I, I, just, I have to say though that um, th there are certain strengths that this university has that it doesn't even it hasn't even realized yet. I mean, there there's so many opportunities here for uh, uh, some really good work to be done at the community level that is just completely ignored. So, thanks. The, the nice thing about being last is that your colleagues have said everything that you were going to say. But let me just say something different. The university is very intense. Uh, <laughs> uh, in all seriousness, I, I mean, I, I, I would underscore much of what's been said. It is having come from Yale and it, that being a, an incredible experience for me as a faculty member um, with really extraordinary scholars and interlocutors. Uh, there is an intensity here in terms of, as someone said, you're only as good as your last idea, basically. And at some level, that is quite liberating. Um, I would argue, though, at another level, if in fact the subject matter about which you're making arguments isn't taken seriously, then it's hard to judge how crafted, how well argued, how reasoned the argument is if, in fact, people really aren't interested in thinking about kind of issues of race and politics. Now, I can say I've been quite lucky here uh, because there's a critical mass of, uh, I think, really wonderful scholars, Michael Dawson, Bob Gooding Williams, who do work on race and politics that I'm surrounded by. And I think, as a whole, we can make those arguments and people <coughs> at least have to listen and, and at some level believe um, that it's important to, st to study this research. But I, I have seen my own students struggle with um, the ability to have their work taken seriously if it's not grounded in a kind of canon that is recognized 
uh, outside of the field of race and politics, let's say. And, and we always want students to be grounded broadly. But I will say kind of the question of intensity has some uh, cont context that we want to pay attention to here. The, the other thing I would say is, uh, for me also as a political scientist, I can't imagine being anywhere in the world um, with such a rich an incredible history to study black politics. I mean, you know, we, we can talk about Barack, we can talk about Harold Washington, we can talk about the dog, I mean, we can talk about the history of um, black politics. On the other hand, I would also say that this is an institution that I think, and I think Rick said it uh, probably beautifully, that hasn't really recognized the opportunities uh, that it's afforded being based on the south side of Chicago, not just as laboratory, as we talked about earlier, but the ability to kind of really imagine a new relationship to communities that's based in partnership and to kind of recreate what it is to be an urban institution, an urban university in the 21st century with very different kind of racial and economic dynamics uh, surrounding it. So. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't trade my experience here for anything in the world, in, in large part because of colleagues like th those on the panel, Adam and the uh, audience, because the graduate students that I work with are in fact exceptional because of the ways in which people interrogate your work and I think make it better. Um, but I do worry that there, we continue to struggle with fewer faculty of color than there should be here. We continue to struggle with um, a perplexed relationship to the surrounding community. We continue to struggle with, I think, the institutionalization of, of areas of study that are focused on kind of, for example, questions of race or gender, and to take those um, areas of instruction and inquiry seriously uh, at the, in the same way that we take other areas, um, engage them and, and fund them and, and give them power for example, the power to tenure. So I think that there are still kind of multiple issues as a faculty member and as a faculty member of color that uh, worry me, but part of my role here is, that, in fact, to, to engage in that struggle, so, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> in all of your responses, you've already, in some sense, answered the second question I had planned to pose about what, was, what were some of the attractive features about being at the university. Um, but um, I thought, so, since you address that, if you have something to add, that would be good. But I thought it might be good to pick up on the, uh, the, uh, the uh, first part of Kathy's response, which concerns the uh, problem of sort of navigating the question of intensity and scrutiny of one's work in such a way that that is constructive over and against a, scrut uh, a posture of scrutiny, which goes to the to the question of the legitimacy of the work that one's uh, uh, undertaking. And I wonder if other panelists have some um, response to that as a, uh, uh, as a problem. Is it something that you've um, confronted? And if so, how have you managed to navigate that problem? Um, I think that's something that I, I confront, particularly in my work around multiracial identity, because it's not something that's necessarily grounded in the canon. Um, and it's also something that students grapple with a lot of times in my classroom where they will feel like their the reactions to readings or the existence of certain readings or the absence of certain readings um, place them in a position to voice an experience that isn't necessarily grounded in a particular tradition or a particular theory. And how does one then inter interface with existing literature, a literature that has quite power, quite a lot of power and credence and legitimacy. And part of what I've enjoyed here is also, I think, the trick that you mentioned of how does one advance an argument that there might actually be interest in, that people may be interested in engaging, but yet you cannot look behind you and sort of stand on all these other folks when you start to feel a little um, uncertain of your argument, because you're the one who's starting and launching that argument on your own. Um, and, I, and I think that can be for particularly faculty of color and junior faculty of color a very difficult place to launch your career, right? When you're coming up for tenure and you're doing something that maybe everyone around you does feel is really important. I think I felt that very much about my work, that there is a recognition of the importance of it yet. Um, there also needs to, we've built into this um, academic world 
um, an understanding of valuing something from the place of critiquing it. And so how do, how do your critiquers, how, how informed are your critics about your work, about what is um, novel about your work and what's not? And how do you separate that out then when, while you're going through the process? And I think that is very hard um, to do as a junior faculty person. Um, and not, um, I would add a third, and not also feel personally critiqued. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you're, for those of us who are studying topics um, about populations we belong to, um, how do you separate all of those? What's about the work? What's about you? What's about that person as a critiquer and their legitimate claim to being a critiquer? Um, and then what's about you? And I think a lot of um, faculty that I, that, of friends of mine who are at other places struggle quite a bit with that, of trying to understand um, what part is about them, what part is about their work, and what part is about something else, um, and how to navigate uh, the politics of that, I think is, is very difficult. Yeah, I mean, I suspect that in the uh, um, sort of the hard sciences, if one, one, makes, one wants to make that distinction, this is, and usually less of a question, but I, I wonder whether for Rick, there, particularly given the focus of your work, this has been something that... I, I, was, I was just about to say it is less of an issue in the sciences. Uh, because, you know, in particular in, in, in genetics and medicine, I mean, it's very trendy. So, you know, there's it, major shifts periodically, and so you may be um, uh, uh, arguing a point that, that very little, you know, folks may see very little value or or, or may not necessarily think it's important, but but ultimately, it'll, you know, things things change, and so um, I I don't see that as necessarily a major problem, except where it comes to issues of race and politics mm -hmm. and science. Then you know there's value placed on on those sorts of things. Um, uh, uh, this whole issue of health disparities research, when, you know, in particular, um, it, it, it it's it's something that has been um, discussed for a very long time, and you would think that there is cer that certain institutions, given where they are geographically, you know, placed, that they would be at the forefront of some of those discussions. But it's not up until recently that that came to be here. Um, uh, so, 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 yeah, there are some, but but for the most part, generally, um, it's it's very trendy. <laughs> uh, Jackie, do you have any thoughts on this particular question? That no. No. Okay. All right. Um, well, I wanted to then go on to um, uh, a, a different question. And, and um, of course, for all of us here, uh, the uh, university as a um, um, institution focused disproportionately on graduate education, right, is I think part of the attraction. That is to say, one comes here um, not only because of the scrutiny um, that um, uh, the, the sort of constructive scrutiny that one can expect for the, for the work, but for the opportunity to, to work with some of the, of the most um, talented um, uh, upcoming scholars that one can find anywhere um, in, the, uh, in the country, if not, uh, if not the world. And I'm wondering whether or not as um, an, an African American faculty member necessarily involved in graduate education, you feel you have any sort of particular or special responsibility towards other, uh, towards African American graduate students or students of color. Is that um, uh, a conscious part of your thinking about the role you ought to be playing here? Or is it a burden um, described in this way that should not be shouldered, um, say, disproportionately by African American um, faculty? So um, maybe I can ask if, uh, well, I'll go to Jackie to start there. Okay. She was hoping I wouldn't say that. Yeah. I guess I would say a couple things. First of all, you're right that Chicago is a graduate-dominated institution, and that certainly was an attraction for me, though I, I do care passionately about teaching undergrads um, and think that the work that I've been able to do in the classroom with them has been as um, pivotal to my research as the work I do with graduate students and especially if we think about mentoring towards the pipeline, right? And not just um, uh, tapping talented African American or other students of color to move on to the PhD, but encouraging white students to become African Americanists too. Um, that that's a part of my work as well. And so when I think of mentoring, it goes both ways. It's about bringing people into the field of study I care about 
and it's also about being a mentor to students of color who may work in the field that I do, maybe not, but have come to me for some type of particular help or guidance. I wouldn't be here if somebody didn't take that time with me. It's just that simple. Um, and I happen to have been in one of those you know, gifted and talented minority programs um, in high school that let me know a thing like a PhD even existed. I didn't know that. So I feel a special obligation to give back what has been given to me. Um, and so I don't, it, it's not so much a burden. I do believe it's service that counts, um, that I know that when I'm looking at a job application um, in an African American as search, it matters to me that, this, that a candidate has provided mentoring service to students in his or her institution or community. I look for that as a measure of professional responsibility, whether the, that person is of color or not. Because that's, to me, what it means to be an African American as scholar, that you're looking to mentor and bring up another generation. Um, so, so when I think about mentoring, yes, it's work I, I do. I wouldn't say it's a burden, but it is extra work that I wish I got credit for, institutional credit for. Um, and that it's not enough to you know, say thank you to me for mentoring how many students during my summers. Um, and that my colleagues in the Renaissance say maybe don't have to do. Um, so I wish that there were more institutional recognition for the mentoring work we provide. I would also say though that mentoring is the responsibility, mentoring students of color I believe is also the responsibility of my white colleagues as well. Uh, some of my best mentors in my graduate institution were not African American. Um, and those relationships saw me through the dissertation, saw me through the job market. I got the best advice from one of my uh, white uh, mentors that I just would have never, ever seen or heard from, say, a good feminist of color. Because this guy was completely about understanding how the power logic of a search ran. And it helped me navigate a very tricky situation that I, I would have mishandled. I know I would have mishandled it. And I'm really glad that he gave me that advice. And so I think that it's the responsibility of my white colleagues as well to reach out and to bring students of color into the fold as well and to bring them into the life of the department as much as it is mine. I just wish we all got some type of substantive institutional credit for the work we do. I think that's right. I think I think I absolutely feel a sense of responsibility, <clears throat> and I don't think of that as a burden at all. Um, however, there a lot of that mentorship happens not in the light of day and not within structures, and I think many departments um, undervalue and think of that as that you're mentoring and um, have a special relationship with students and don't necessarily see it as actually you're contributing to the retention of these students in the department, you're helping them um, with professional development. And so that in addition to counting it, counting it in all the ways in which it probably matters, not just in terms of personal development. I think a lot of times people look at the mentoring that happens um, between <coughs> faculty of color and students of color as somehow a very personal, emotional relationship. And, um, and it is, and it can be, and that certainly is. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but in a social work department, that gets pejoratively labeled as you do in therapy. Right, and, and yes, that is actually sometimes what happens and there's a reason why there's a Kleenex box next to the, to the chair that is in my office, however, and I, and I don't devalue that. I think that's actually important work to be done um, and that when you find that sort of relationship that you can have with a, a professor where you can be honest that you're struggling and that you can t tell them the things that you're struggling with, I think that's important and I don't think that's therapy. I think that's, um, there's something distinctly different between those two things. But I also think that there um, is much more that goes on in those conversations, um, at least that happen in, in my office, that are about professional development, that are advising students about how to think about a certain circumstance. Much of how they cope as students of color on this campus can be a model for how they, color, uh, how they cope as a professional of color in a predominantly white agency, institution, world, you name it. And so that I consider a lot of the mentoring that I do not just limited to their own academic advancement and development,
but also their development as human beings, as people of color, how to think about that, how do you cope with that, and how do you develop relationships that can nurture you and support you um, to achieve the goals that you want to do, and that departments need to recognize that, that that is actually what's going on, and how do we invite white colleagues to feel that equal sense of responsibility to all their students so that they do that, and how do we help students to recognize that they need to think about their white colleagues as sources of that support. I think it goes sort of both ways, and I think a lot of times students of color are, for very good reasons, reticent to reach out and be vulnerable and develop those sorts of relationships with their colleagues that, or with their professors, that I think can really blossom into very important and equally important um, relationships going forward across their professional lifetimes, so. I don't, I don't have much more to add, that's, that's good. I, I, um, I, I do believe that it's utterly um, uh, of major importance that, that uh, we, we uh, mentor African American uh, uh, students. Um, utterly important. M my only concern though, and, and this is, may, it may just be specific to the sciences, I don't know, but you know, I think it's important that we mentor them, but I, I can't mentor all of them mm -hmm. myself. And I have a problem when you funnel all the black students into, you know, well, you should talk to this guy here, you know, he's African American. And then you look up and you don't have any more room. Right. And then you look up and you, and you see that the white students aren't being funneled to you, you know, or, you know, or the black students funneled up, you know, so it's this, the, the, that's where it becomes a little, a little crazy because um, at the same time, you know, I, I want to help. African American students, and uh, but but it, but it um, it can it can if, if it's not done right, it could be uh, a problem. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> you keep leaving it at that. <laughs> uh, again, I would agree with everything that my colleagues have said. I I, would, I guess add in. Um, I guess emphasize again Rick's last point about. Uh, it's one thing to mentor students in your department. It's another thing to mentor students of color all over the university, um, which I'm willing to do. I was going to say happy to do. I'm willing to do. I'm not happy to do, actually. Uh, it's, and it has nothing to do with those students. It has to do with the absence of mentors and support in their departments and kind of the structural nature of that and the university's responsibility to rectify that. Uh, not only in hiring faculty of color, but in ensuring that there are faculty uh, who study the same things, who are engaged in types of research, who bring those students onto their research and those issues. And then the last thing I'll say is, you know, it, it, mentoring is actually a joy when it's, you know, reasonable. But when, again, you're mentoring students from all over the university, and I, I can speak probably for everyone here, being asked to do administrative work, uh, sitting on multiple committees, uh, representing the university outside of the university to communities. Uh, it's just, there's just a lot of work to do. And that's not to say that all of our car colleagues aren't stressed, but it is to kind of speak to the specific and at times extra burden that faculty of color, I think, um, carry here at the university, in part because we love the university and are committed to the university. So I think all of these things have to be considered when thinking about kind of our attitudes, our willingness, our ability to mentor students of color. Sure. Because I'm curious about, as a, as a humanist, I have these fantasies that um, the sciences, social and biological, natural sciences, because you're oftentimes oriented around the lab model or the research team model, that advising and mentoring can happen a bit more efficiently. This is my fantasy. Um, because, you know, you have your team of students and you're working on a shared data set or you're working on a shared problem and they've got their spin and you've got your spin. and. Whereas as an English professor, you know, it's one student at a time, mm -hmm. and which I find to be very labor intensive and every project is different. Um, so am I wrong in fantasizing that on some level, given the lab or the team-based model of research, that the structures of the practices of mentoring might be? No, there, are, there, there are these group sort of activities, the sharing of, of, um, of ideas and but, but, but they're individual projects. And so in the end, you're still individually okay. Okay. mentoring yeah, okay. students. I mean, but and you may share space mm -hmm. <laughs> in a laboratory. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, there's still that individual mentorship, and um, and then they have their own their own spins or their own projects mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that they have to do individually. So so it, it's mm -hmm. not that different. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, your your responses have already gone towards suggesting some things that the university could begin to do to uh, improve the um, um, intellectual life and working conditions of faculty of color here. Among them, um, mechanisms to recognize the individual mentoring, the invisible mentoring that all of us are engaged in. Um, some suggestion that the um, uh, our faculty colleagues, regardless of race, color, or whatever, recognize that they share responsibility for mentoring all of the students in the uh, in their departments or, divi or or units and that it's not simply the responsibility of faculty of color to take um, charge of the uh, um, careers of, the, of students of color and one of the big um, things that a university can obviously do is to uh, uh, continue to hire to locate and, and bring more faculty of color onto the, um, uh, the, the scholars onto the, onto, the, onto the faculty. Are there any other things that stand out in terms of what a university like the University of Chicago could be doing, should be doing, that would enhance the you know, intellectual research or pedagogical lives of you, <laughs> faculty of color? Anything that stands out that we haven't, uh, that we haven't mentioned? And then after the, uh, the panel has a chance at this question, that we'll open up the floor to um, um, questions from, uh, from those of you who have been waiting patiently at this point. But are there things we should be doing? Do we bring our secret lists? I know. I have a book <laughs> in here. But, but I'm curious, I mean, because Rick, a couple times, you and Kathy, you picked up on this, the idea that we're in this Southside community and there's a potential there that could be tapped. And I was wondering, could you say more about what that would consist of? Oh, sorry. I realize I'm causing a problem here. <laughs> well, you know, the, the, this community, the Southside community, has its own particular history, and then there's a history of, uh, of past relationships with the university, and I think that um, uh, many of them haven't been great, and they can improve on that, and they can build, there's a lot of room for building more trust in the community. And, uh, and, and, and once that's formed, there, there could be some really good collaborative uh, 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 programs and partnerships that could emerge, that could actually um, uh, 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 take the university, as, a, as you said, as an urban institution, mm -hmm. to another level. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, in, in healthcare, and I mean, economics, everything, in many different institutions, not just, you know, science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, this morning we heard extensively uh, about the incredible history of social scientists, and in particular, black social scientists at the, his at the University of Chicago. It seems to me that we have a really amazing tradition to build on. Um, and there are a number of initiatives currently, the uh, Urban Education Institute, the Urban Health Initiative, um, that could position us again as a partner in the progress of urban communities. I, I think it's a mistake if, in fact, we begin to frame this as the laboratory, again, for the University of Chicago, where, in fact, we go out and solve people's problems. But if we could reimagine ourselves as being a, a, a stellar research institute, or building a stellar research institute, I keep calling it the Harold Washington uh, Institute for Urban <laughs> Progress. Everybody got that? Uh, <laughs> there we go. Da -da. Um, where we bring, bring kind of the best and the brightest to the University of Chicago to work in partnership with our surrounding communities to just do exceptional work. I mean, we, we have a kind of incredible moment here with the election of Barack Obama, with the world looking at Hyde Park and the south side of Chicago. Possibly we have the Olympics. Um, but it, so if we could really kind of harness this moment and say we're going to create something new built on that tradition, though, of, of contributing and working in partnership, it seems to me that we could change the ranks in terms of increasing the number of faculty. We could have incredible numbers of postdocs. We could, it could be the place. If you want to study race and policy or race and practice, you have to spend time at this institution. And it, currently, that is not how mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. most of the academy views the University mm -hmm. of Chicago. Mm -hmm. so. 
couple other things that oh, you've, got, you've got a list no. do we say hiring and cluster hiring in we did say hiring but we didn't say we cluster didn't say hiring cluster. do you want to say something about that well I, th I think the, the potential to hire not individuals so you know every year we hire one person here and one person here and we lose one person in some other department but in fact to build clusters to, to one way we know to attract faculty of color in particular is to say Jackie what what three people would you like to be in conversation with on a daily basis and if in fact we can bring that cluster of people here not only do we have the you know, a higher probability of getting them here but we also have a higher probability of retaining them mm -hmm. and we bring a cluster you also start to bring mm -hmm. it starts to kind of attract graduate students the yeah. best graduate yeah. students right. because now they know there are four faculty in this area so if one right. leaves I still have you know a committee mm -hmm. and uh, people will be able to kind of generate new research ideas support my research so I think not just hiring but the university really should be engaged in cluster hiring. That's, you know, that's just one of them. Um, the floor is open for other questions, suggestions, comments. There's a mic coming. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I'm just imagining this conversation happening 15 years ago. And I think had it happened 15 years ago, there would have been more statement of frustration, more statement of alienation. Not to say that that either, you know, it's our goal, it's what we're supposed to do when we get up and do this. But I guess I want to know whether or not a change has actually happened, which is that the fact that much of the beginning of the conversation was about the rigorously professional character of work for a faculty of color, in the same sort of way that any faculty would experience it here and that that was a good thing because that felt accessible. Has some corner been turned, not for everybody, this is an exclusive institution, there are all sorts of problems in terms of the filters that don't allow large numbers of people of color to ever come into institutions like this. But for those that do get it, has a corner been turned, are you saying, where it is in fact possible to be seen as a professional scholar who happens to be black, rather than a black scholar who may or may not be a professional? Or is there a point, is there a need to go back and qualify that in shape? Because a lot of it was about what this institution is and how the institution is accessible. And I know that I say that sometimes now. I don't think I could have said that. And I don't remember many people saying that 15 years ago when I would ask them what's it like to be a professor at X institution. So have we turned the corner? Should we be talking about the turning of that corner in a particular kind of way? Or do we need to step back and shape it? Yeah, well, what do you think, Ken? You were here 15 years ago, Ken. Getting out and on my age here, or, or long, longevity. Um, has a corner been turned? I think that's a hard question to, to answer, in part because when I recall conversations, I arrived here in 1991. Um, when, I re when I recall conversations with um, my senior colleagues who were here at the time, among the reasons they gave for um, their decisions for, for being here was, were, was precisely um, because they felt that they were respected at the University of Chicago first as scholars and only incidentally, as it was described in terms of the kinds of diversity that they might uh, bring for other political and social, uh, social missions. Um, now this observation had a kind of um, perverse side to it because they, they uh, would often say, well, it, it's, uh, it just so happens because the University of Chicago has sort of been so behind and kind of hidebound about not taking seriously some of the um, obvious issues and problems that other universities were, 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 de were dealing with. It just turned out that when they made, a, when you know, a department made a decision to go after a particular scholar, at least this is how it was perceived, there was a recognition that this was a decision, decision guided solely by an assessment of um, the quality of the work according to some sort of you know, you know, life of the mind scale. Now you, we can question that as much as we want. I'm not, and I'm not saying we shouldn't, but um, I, I, make, I, I mention that because I think that that makes it hard to say exactly what kind of 
corner has been turned with, with respect to at least that kind of argument. I do think the, the, the difference I can see now is um, a recognition that you can more explicitly talk about issues of race, diversity, disparity, along with questions of the life of the mind and not have those issues be, be, be seen as necessarily in competition with one another. That is to say that there is a, um, a, a greater awareness that in some sense the excellence that one is striving for you know, particularly, this is again an argument that I think is more um, relevant to the hum uh, humanistic and social uh, social sciences. That the excellence that one is striving for um, requires actually be uh, being more attentive to, and not pretending that um, um, they don't exist. You know, issues of um, identity disparity and uh, um, uh, and the like. Um, so, if there's Again, you know, and some of this I think is um, um, so. I guess if there if there is a difference, one is you could say you know um, driven by the fact that we have greater numbers. Um, I don't know that there's been a sea change in um, the uh, uh, you know mode of thinking um, associated with the university, but that's just my opinion on this. There's a question in here. Oh, oh, okay, deep, yeah. I have a two-part question. Um, one is about uh, Jackie's fantasy. I'd like to go back to that about the role to which mentorship in the sciences um, is um, is a little more transparent in that you sort of be credit for it because as a scientist, even in the team model, even in one-on-one -on -one, uh, work with graduate students, this is an expectation of all faculty members and something that's actually part of what you're supposed to do to the extent to which I'm wondering if you feel that you do get uh, credit for it with one of the uh, faculty and other participants. And the second part is um, something Kathy alluded to about when uh, faculty members of color, and in addition to their, uh, their publishing and teaching responsibilities, also have to do sort of some PR work for the university. I guess I think there's sort of a diversity critique for young faculty members. And I wonder if you, if you could talk about how young faculty you work with when they were graduate students, uh, you know, report back on this being a big part of, of you know, their workload in their first years of, of uh, being in fact, or if they don't actually do this, or they don't know about so, um, so yeah, we, we get credit for, because you know, in, the, in, these, in many of the sciences, and particularly like in, in the, at the med school, it's, a lot of classes are team taught. So it's not like we have to prepare these you know, entire semesters worth of, 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 of uh, lesson plans. But um, we get credit for training the students in the lab. So yeah, there is a little different. You know, it's a little bit different there, the four students. Yeah, and then, yeah, that's, that's a big well, 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 well. And then you get grants, too. And then you get grants, too. And then you get grants, too. That's really important. Yeah. That's really, I mean, I, I have to say, I'm I mean, feeling a little <laughs> hostile. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's our side. Yeah, so we wish we hadn't dropped out of our bio classes. I mean, no, I mean, I think that, that those kind of structural differences matter. Um, by field, and it's important for us to take stock of them. I think, um, I mean, I'm, I, I wish I could buy out of my teaching sometimes. Yeah, yeah, that's um, it. That's a good point. That's I can't as a humanist. Um, and, and the ways in which you're then, okay, I'm going to do it. One of my advisors taught me to do it. You know, I'm going to be way too far this time. Oh, so okay. you don't? Uh, yeah, these little things. Um, no, 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 so that was, that was one point, and, um, that, that, that for, the human, for the humanities, we are underfunded in those kinds of ways, and we operate at, at disadvantages those kinds of ways. When you're teaching you know, a four-course load and you've got 25 to 38 students, you know, it's, it's hard to then figure out how to weave your research into the teaching to make it all kind of feel like some type of efficient um, stream. Right? And, and you've got those bodies to track in addition to the graduate students you're having to mentor and advise as well. So, so the disciplines do matter. And that's why I was just curious because I'm actually interested in ways to import mm -hmm. some of so those practices right, right. And I think it should, into I mean, the that, humanities. You should be able to buy out uh, some of your teaching, you know, based on a book or uh, grants or whatever. But that's, 
that's not my idea. I can't make that decision. <laughs> but but um, but if you think about it, when you take on a graduate student, let's say in the sciences, and you know they're in a lab and the project they're doing a project with you in the lab. I mean, you, it's like having a child. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it, they're with you for the rest of their career, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they're they're, they're graduate training. And you, your funding has to stay consistent, or you know, I mean, there's so many, so much stress there related to just that one student that you know it's a little different from having a class where you're preparing uh, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, lesson plans. So, so it's, it is, it, it's, it's, it's different, but it does, you know, it, it, it has its, um, its, its, its strong points and its, and, uh, and its weak points. But, but back to the first year, um, going out on the on the on the, on the uh, dog and pony show, <laughs> you know, the, all of the. Um, the request for uh, the new, new faculty who are uh, are of color. Uh, it's it's something that uh, that I think we all sort of get you know get used to real quickly. You know, I remember my very first day here. Um, they said, "Oh, by the way, there's a uh, there's an interview with Fox News, uh, noon." <laughs> but before you go, I got to come down there and take a look at you. <laughs> Make sure you know. Maybe I had horns or something. I don't know, but <laughs> but but so you know it, it's uh, it, it's part of the you know and I think you, you quickly learn that it's part of the whole package too. Um, you know a good marketing department that you know they, they see value in that in you, and um, sometimes it's 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 you can use it to your benefit. Other times it's a, it's a burden. Other questions or. Can I just add to that? Because sure. It's, it's not only the university, but if in fact you're what you might consider an activist scholar, if in fact you're someone who wants to be connected to the communities around here, you also have to go and uh, hear the stories of how the university has done those That's communities right. wrong. You have, to ex you have to acknowledge that wrongdoing. You have to figure out your positioning, both relative to those communities and the university, because you know, no matter what, you're still of the university, even if you want to distance yourself at that moment. That's what folks often see. So that can also be exhausting, right? I mean, it, but, but necessary in terms of building those relationships. So while you're building those relationships at a personal level, I know Jack, you, and you're also helping the university, even if, you know, you, they may not recognize it, but a community member who can recognize a black faculty member that they can respect and talk to does a lot for the university. Right, right. So, yeah. yeah, that happens a lot for, yeah. I mean, child welfare. You know the history of child welfare in the black community. Right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I think for, for junior faculty, it puts you in, a, in an interesting position in that when, as you're hearing that anger and the sort of the very legitimate anger, um, it puts you in an odd role of both representing the, the university, healing the relationship with the university and figuring out what that means if that word gets back <laughs> about how you did that, right? And so as a junior faculty, you can sometimes find yourself in very volatile um, uh, situations that are very public, um, where you are navigating multiple landmines all the time um, that sometimes work at cross purposes for which you are getting very little mentorship about yeah, how to do, to do this. Right. Um, and I would argue that your colleagues your colleague may or may not know how to right. help you, even right. if you ask them how right. to help you. Right. Um, and so that, you know, to get the alienation, is sort of this opposite problem of fame <laughs> um, and alienation in the context of that, um, for lack of your own mentorship, perhaps, right. about how to navigate these things that are happening outside the purview of your nine right. to five right. life. If I could, I mean, an ex a personal example for me um, comes from the library, the archive project that I work on, and I want because we're here in the library to acknowledge the the absolutely groundbreaking work and um, valuable work that my project has been able to do because of the library and the ways in which the staff of the Special Collections Research Center here, all the way up to the library director, have partnered with us to go out into the community to organize the archives that we do. And I can absolutely attest to how many hours I had to spend with the directors of, of, of community repositories who had their own horror stories about the University of Chicago trying to get their stuff. And what were we going to do that was so different? Um, and having to realize that we were our project was taking on transforming that perception 
But the thing that has been so striking to me about this project has been the ways in which sharing a common intellectual commitment has allowed that partnership to thrive and that we're able to bring our intellectual capital and all the kinds of institutional capital that we have here and leverage it on behalf of community institutions that don't have the capital but have the intellectual resources. They just don't have the labor power. To bring those two things together has been absolutely transformative for the community institutions, for the students on the project who work in these institutions, and, I, and I, I just have to, Judy and Dan, I would hope for the library itself. I think it's been fantastic. It's been a win-win situation for every party involved. But, it's, but I have to say, it's something I did not take on until I got tenure. <laughs> That's a good one. I hear that all. <laughs> because, of the, because of the time that it would require, I had to get the book done. The book matters most here. We can debate that. But it does. And so getting the book done was first. But I have to say, having tenure meant to the community institutions, I was here. You know, because this is what I'm giving my political capital to as a tenured professor. So it was tactical, but it, was also, it, it, but it also mattered, it seems, to the people who I'm working with in the community. Um, so taking on these kinds of projects, you, I think you do have to be strategic about them, you know? And when will you be in the best possible position to deliver and to create leverage for the, for the institutions and organizations that you want to bring into dialogue with the, with the university? But I have to say that I've, I've just been um, really fortunate. The, the project I run, Mapping the Stacks, that is my bubble of joy. It is, it is, it is the reason I stay. It really is the reason I stay, because it's the one thing I know I will be able to do that brings together the research imperative, the teaching imperative, and the community service imperative, and everybody wins out of it. Nobody doesn't get anything. Everybody gets what they want out of this project, and I don't know that I'll ever have a chance for something like that to happen again. Yes. I just have a suggestion. Currently, the universe, uh, concerning the topic of the relationship between the university and the community, currently the administration is overhauling the Department of Community Affairs and renaming it the Department of Civic Engagement, um, and hiring new VP, and so on. And it's, it's, it's throwing all kinds of, of, um, of rhetoric in this direction. So maybe now's a good time for a faculty of color to aggressively engage the administration to try to get their voice and their concerns to be part of this new of this new venture and to maybe ensure that it is something substantial. Because it's unclear whether or not it, 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 you know, to what degree it's an earnest move, but you could ensure that it is, perhaps. Mm -hmm. well, I, I just speak. <laughs> <laughs> you're part of the administration, so. Uh, yeah. yeah. yeah uh, I, I think you're absolutely right in terms of uh, the transformation of the office of, I think it used to be community development of community affairs to civic engagement. Um, I can say that uh, Anne-Marie Lipinski, who is the new VP, has actually reached out, I know, to a number of faculty of color. I just had lunch with her yesterday. I know there's a lunch uh, next week. Um, and we have to remember that although she's the VP, there actually are a number of folks of color who've been working there for quite a while. So, let me move on. so uh, I, I do think it's critical that faculty engage that office give them their ideas, hold the administration accountable. But I don't, want to, I don't want to suggest in any way that this is all happening and we have no input or, or voice into it. So I think you're right. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add. I, I think it's a, it's a good point, but it's, yeah, it's something that uh, in, in various ways we've been um, involved in and engaged uh, uh, with. We have, uh, for example, a diversity leadership um, council which focuses on non-academic aspects of diversity, including employment, um, community affairs, and uh, business procurement. And that group has met with uh, Anne-Marie Lipinski um, as well to share um, concerns, visions, and uh, just have general discussion around the goals of that, ob uh, of, of that office and um, the broader, broader university uh, uh, mission and agenda pertaining to uh, um, diversity and inclusion.
the other, going the other way, and you know, sort of what, and perhaps envisioning what a successful situation would be like, especially if the university is fairly satisfied with its own intellectual life. You know, so, uh, and I'm thinking because I've just left the university that had its own history of segregation, so it had a fairly short period of having black faculty, but in fact, has a, that's the University of Maryland, but actually has a pretty large black faculty now, especially women of color, and gone to USC, which doesn't have a very big black faculty, but is extraordinarily, I would say, open to the community of color that it surrounds, I mean, so that it's very normal to see black and Hispanic children trooping in and out of buildings and the faculty gives a million dollars a year of their own salary to community programs. And the alumni raises, a mil black alumni raises a million dollars a year, which the university matches. So, you know, it, and it's striking to me because they have a much better relationship with the university, with the community than UCLA. Mm -hmm. No, at US, now I'm talking about USC now, the University of Southern California. <laughs> but, so it's been striking to me that certain kind of histories can make a real difference. And with USC, it's a fairly recent history deciding just or the riots not to leave and to actually have a president that says we're going to engage, which ironically didn't mean anything about increasing the size of the faculty and then say the University of Maryland increasing the size of the faculty, but not really having much engagement in, with, you know, in the very large black population that's surrounding it. So, you know, I guess I'm wondering, like, if Chicago's rich history of studying the black community is as much a stumbling block, or even per, uh, as it is a possible entree to the, you know, to the community, whether, you know, say, people need to think about a new model of how, what community interaction ideally would look like. I'm just curious with the USC model, can, do you have like a sense of when that transformation occurred? Because I'm thinking that, I would think that the establishment of the program in American culture is there and someone like George Sanchez directing it and then becoming dean would have a tremendous impact on that, that type of outreach effort. I think it had a little bit, but I think it really, with the community, it had, I think There's a longer American studies and ethnicity attracted this incredible amount of but the community difference, I think, really has to do with the president. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay. And they were thinking, I don't know how many of you know where USC is, it's in, now people in Los Angeles are not allowed to call this area South Central. It's in South Los Angeles. <laughs> and, uh, but the fact that alumni wanted to move it to where Pepperdine is, which is in mm -hmm. Malibu, and uh, when he came, he decided not to move and to really interact. But at the same time, the Black Alumni Association had started maybe in the early 70s, and they started aggressively raising money for scholarships for black students. So USC has more black students than UCLA. It probably has more black students than UCLA and Berkeley combined in terms of percentages and numbers. And part of that is that the alumni started raising money and the university matches it two to one for undergrads and one to one for grad students. And so something like 20% of the kids in these schools that are around the university end up becoming, getting into the university. So they came, I think it really, in that case, it seems to have come from the top. Sure, 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 rather, sure, sure, you know, sure, sure, sure. Rather than, but the black alumni were very smart. They also raised money for the Hispanic 
and the Asian Pacific Islanders until they got their own organization. So you have, you know, the alumni of color have a really big say in what happens to students, largely because they raise so much money for them. See that that that. Wow, I mean that's like, I'm not a sociologist at all, but it seems to me that there's so many different kinds of social formations that are making that possible. I would wonder whether or not in that cohort of black alumni, you're talking about you know, a group of folks who came of earning power age in order to amass capital that way and to, and to deploy it the, the really intelligent way they have. Um, and I'm also thinking about how that's different from what we would face here at the University of Chicago, if I can, you know, the administrators like, tell me to not say this if I can't. You know, our, our, our rate of alumni giving seems to me to be very different. Um, and partly because a lot of our undergrads go on to graduate school and don't necessarily become, um, take on jobs that allow them to give back at the orders that a USC alumni might be able to or a Yale alumni might be able to. I'm remembering this from a, a memo I read when I first got here. And so I, th I think it's absolutely right to point to USC as a kind of model thing to think about and to parse some of that out about the difference it makes to have a president who has this vision and commitment to engagement, the difference of having an active alumni association that's large enough and has enough capital within it to redirect it this, you know, in the ways that you've described, to think about the kind of faculty buy-in that has to be present to support a president that way. I mean, it seems like USC is an incredible kind of model. Well, it's not. Not I'm not saying for perfect, but, 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 but it allows us to then think about what can and can't happen here at the University of Chicago that's distinctive. I mean, again, just to think about our own college because what, I, it, the numbers are something like 9,000 or so graduate and professional students here and 3,800 or so. No, it's, not, 5, it's almost 5,000 okay. now. Yeah. I got to keep up on my numbers. But still, we're talking about a real difference between graduate and undergrad. And so when we talk about alumni dollar giving, it's probably going to look very different. And yep. so how, but how do we cope with that and how do we make good with that? And what are the black alumni kind of pools within that? It might look very different if we had a lot of John Rogerses amongst our undergrad alumni, there might be something to do. Yeah, just uh, quickly, I think the, the one qualification, as I understand, to the characterization that you've given of the alumni giving base, it's, it's not th that the rate of giving by our alums is so much out of line with our, our peers. It had to do, first of all, with the relatively or ex extraordinarily small size of the college going back a number of years, um, and that's changed dramatically. Uh, recently, and and it, it has ha had to do with the, I guess the, where the, where the big difference has been is in terms of, you know, donors with big 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 bucks to give the, you know, you know fifty million dollar kinds of gifts and, and the um, relative difference uh, um, difference there. So um, I mean, and, and I guess just in, in terms of thinking about recent differences at the University of Chicago as opposed to when I came here, um, uh, now what, seventeen years ago. Uh, we, we do have, we've, we've seen a significant growth, of course, in um, our um, population, both in absolute numbers and as a percentage of the undergraduate population of uh, students of color, particularly black, uh, uh, black students. The last uh, um, three years, I think, um, in, uh, in succession have been the most diverse classes that this institution has ever seen and that diversity has also has also been reflected by um, a, an absolute increase in the you know qualifications of students across the board if you're looking at things like SAT scores um, um, high school GPAs um, uh, um, and, and the like that has been to a certain degree um, part and parcel of a shift in, in, in you know at the level of the official rhetoric of the university and I think um, a rhetoric that has actually had some tangible effect, beginning with the uh, uh, the Randall presidency, towards fr from igno uh, acknowledging the checkered role that the university has played in its relations in the, on the broader South Side, and making that an explicit um, um, area of uh, concern and, uh, and and redress. Now, I, um, I don't know. I, I couldn't say that. One, that as a result of that, you have more um, people in the surrounding community, let's say, feeling that the University of Chicago is 
their institution and you know um, that walking across the campus is something that they understand as part of their you know um, uh, you know right as being part of this broader uh, broader na neighborhood but you ha you have had increased intent attention to things like the uh, urban uh, education um, uh, uh, institute and increase in scholarship monies uh, targeted specifically for sh uh, Chicago public school uh, uh, students and so there, there there have been those kinds of uh, uh, kinds of changes but I do think there you know there really is still a sense of maybe the distinctive or the, the boundaries that still exist between this as an institution and the neighborhood of, in which it's a part but just if, uh, if, if there is one big difference I guess to pick up on a question that Adam asked, asked earlier I think there is more explicit and ongoing recognition of the extent to which this is you know this is an institution on the south side of Chicago um, in a, in a, as a positive, um, um, you know, a, a rhetorical um, uh, um, uh, statement than there was when I arrived, where it really was a kind of, um, this is an institution and watch out, <laughs> it's, in this, it's on the south side of Chicago, so you have to, you, you have to behave accordingly. So that, that has been a big, uh, significant shift. Okay. I, I just want to, I, I mean, I, I think Ken is absolutely right. I think the university has moved a bit from a pure laboratory and kind of building the gates and then going out and studying and coming back to a model of increasingly service. Now, I think the difficulty is, is often when you ask folks in the surrounding communities, what do you want? Part of what they want are services, right? But I think there still needs to be, a, so they want better schools and if we can provide those to charter schools, that's what we'll do. They want better health care if we can provide it to the urban health initiative. Um, and that's what we'll do. Um, it, and also what they've asked for at times is policing. They want to extend the boundaries of the university's police uh, uh, force. But I think we have to envision something else, which is partnership. And what does that look like? What does it look like to bring the intellectual weight of the university? I think Jackie's project is an example. I try to do some of this work for the Black Youth Project. I mean, we all do. The intellectual work of the university outside the kind of bounds of the university and to partner with communities, not just service them. And I think that's kind of the next phase, hopefully, that we can enter into, but I don't, right, I don't see us right. there yet. Yeah, some people call it community-based participatory right. research. Exactly. Well, no, I don't, I think, yeah, well, I think that's know, right, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's, that's why when you were talking about, you know, the study of uh, libraries, that's a different model. I mean, that's, you know, where you have the other, where you have the community engaged in, in, um, in the planning stages and saying this is, this, is, this is what we have to offer and this is what this is how we'd like to see it. Mm -hmm. and in a respectful dialogue mm -hmm. and that's something that has been missing for a long time. Okay, actually, I know there's another question, but uh, we're really at the point where we need to stop because we have the uh, student panel next. So please join me in thanking Professor Cohen, Professor Kittle, Professor Samuels, and Professor Kittle. <laughs>